Hello and welcome to Nudge, the consumer psychology podcast with me, Phil Agnew. Now, no one will tell you that pricing a product or service is easy. It isn't. There are a lot of things that can go wrong and a lot of mistakes to make. So how do we avoid these mistakes? How can we learn from others? And what can we do to make sure that our pricing is right? Well, to help answer those questions, I'm joined by Emmanuel Salamab. Emmanuel has spent the past eight years helping brands increase their profits with smart pricing strategies. After working on pricing at Omnicom, Gap, and leading pricing at Carter, Emmanuel now runs his own pricing technology company called Run Pricing Tests. He helps companies in all sorts of industries increase their profits by building pricing strategies that work. Today, we're covering the common mistakes businesses make in regards to pricing. But first, I asked Emmanuel to talk through his career to date. My name is Emmanuel. I run a pricing consultancy called Run Pricing Tests. We help teams generate lifts to their profit and and uh, both top line and bottom line growth really through adding rigor, adding data, uh, adding a bit of the scientific method to how teams are monetizing and thinking about their price strategy. A bit of further context, my entire background has been in pricing. It's been my sole professional focus and, and really passion, which is always kind of an unusual thing to say because pricing is <laughs> it's kind of a niche. And as a separate discipline, I think really has only been in existence probably for 20 or 30 years. I mean, certainly people have been pricing since the beginning of time, but as its own distinct discipline, separate from marketing, I think it's, it's relatively new. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a field and a, and a course of work that I've seen have tremendous impact with the product teams I've been fortunate to work with over my career. It's one of the things I think is neglected often and has such a potential to help teams drive the kind of growth and trajectory for their business that they're looking to, to do. Uh, any opportunity I get to evangelize pricing and talk about pricing, I'm always excited to do because I don't think it gets the intention that it deserves. Testing prices is Emmanuel's world. He has spent his career working on different pricing strategies, running tests and seeing what works. Running tests is so important because often our ideas about pricing aren't particularly accurate. In fact, our gut instinct is often wrong because we're really bad at predicting how consumers will act. Now, one very common view is that lowering your price will increase your sales. Now, this makes a lot of sense. If a product becomes cheaper, more people can afford it, so it should increase sales. But consumers can be irrational and won't always behave the way you think. In the brilliant book Priceless, William Poundstone shares a story about an LA off-license. The owner had a huge amount of cheap wine that wasn't moving off the shelves. Nobody would buy his wine. So he tried something interesting. He increased the price from 79 cents per bottle to 99 cents per bottle. Now I should say that this was a few decades ago which explains those low prices, but this was still a fairly significant increase in price. Now, after increasing the price of the wine, sales actually rose. The off-license sold out of 99 cent wine in a week. Weird, right? We think that decreasing prices increases sales, but here it's the opposite. Clearly, 79 cents was deemed too cheap, and buyers only considered it once the price increased. It's not a one-off phenomenon. One study offered luxury perfume at a London store. Consumers were asked to sample the perfume and rate their likelihood to purchase. However, halfway through the experiment, the researchers switched the label on the test perfume and doubled the price from £40, which was before, to £80. This small change had a big effect. Upon seeing the higher prices, participants were more than twice as likely to buy the perfume. At the lower price, only 33% were willing to buy, while at the higher price, 78% were willing to buy. This is why testing is important. If you don't test, you will never spot the irrational ways consumers behave, and you'll make a number of mistakes. Anyway, let's hand back to Emmanuel, who starts by talking through one of the biggest mistakes he's seen his clients make. I think in general, it, it, there's just kind of a blind spot and a blindness to to pricing. There are a, a battery of mistakes that I've seen teams make. More than anything, it's the inattentiveness and the lack of rigor that 
they bring to the table in making uh, making monetization decisions. Um, so I think that's overarching the mistake. But I think specifically on, on, on a more tactical level, cost plus pricing is certainly very popular. The reality with that approach to pricing, and it's I think it's very demonized within the pricing community, and I, I think it's a little overly criticized. The, the, the issue ultimately is that your customers have no idea what it costs you to produce anything, and that what they're paying for is the benefit, the value that you're providing. Um, so benchmarking your prices off of what it costs you almost always leaves a bunch of money on the table. A better, a better framework to think about pricing, and I think the phrase value-based pricing is gaining popularity, and I, I, I think it's almost bordering on, bordering on cliche now, but the analogy I like to use is uh, imagine an airline setting their prices once for all of their fares and then never revisiting it again. We would look at that and go, that seems insane. I mean, competitors are changing their prices all the time. Different destinations become more or less popular with passengers. I mean, seasonality is a thing. You have these black swan events like coronavirus. I mean, someone should probably be looking at prices and price levels on a regular basis. The, the message I really try to deliver is, is it's less about a one-time exercise of, let's say, looking at your costs and slapping on a, a margin that feels right. It's also about doing this once. It's, it's got to be this internal capability and this routine revisiting of, does our pricing make sense um, relative to the market and, and our customers? It's a mistake to use cost plus margin pricing as it's not how consumers view the world. Consumers don't know the cost of every good, and we're not very good at agreeing on how much something should cost. One wonderful example of this comes from a great study by Richard Fowler. In his study, participants were presented with the following scenario. It is a hot day at a beach, and your friend offers to buy you a specific brand of beer from the local corner shop. He asks you what your top price is to pay. He won't get you the beer if it's over that price. Fowler asks this question to hundreds of business executives back in the 1980s, and the average answer was $1.50. That was the top price they were willing to pay. Fowler then asked hundreds of others the same question, but he changed one thing. Instead of your friend heading to the corner shop, he was now heading to a hotel resort. Now, when answering that question with that slight tweak, the group's answer jumps from $1.50 to a top price of $2.65. Remember, the product is identical in this case. You're still getting the same beer, and that beer will taste the same whether it's from the corner shop or the resort, and yet the amount people are willing to spend jumps by almost double. The amount we are willing to pay isn't dependent simply on the cost to create a product. Clearly, other factors come into play. Now, upon hearing this, you might think that the solution is pretty straightforward. If you just ask customers what they're willing to pay, you can figure out how much you should charge. That's what Fowler did in his experiment, so perhaps it'll work for you and your business. Well, my guest, Emmanuel, wouldn't agree. Yeah, this is a uh, <laughs> very contentious topic within the, the pricing community. So once, you, once you're convinced of this, the problem of figuring out how much we should charge and there's stated preference analysis, which is in effect asking people what their preference is and willingness to pay for where things are. The survey techniques, research techniques have become increasingly more complicated and sophisticated as a way of reducing the bias. Marketers might be familiar with conjoint analysis, which is one survey technique, Van Westendorp, Max Diff. They're all variants of the same overall strategy, which is like ask people in your, in your target market what they're willing to pay for stuff. The problem, as you, I think, illustrated, is what people say that they're willing to do and what they actually do in practice can be very different. And so the data you're collecting in in this format tends to be very unreliable. When you ask people about a hypothetical, the type of data you're collecting is some projection into the future, this future state that a, a person imagines themselves in, basing your strategy then on what amounts to relatively unreliable data, it's better than nothing. And I, and I, I, I hasten to, to caveat this with any data you can bring to inform a pricing decision. There's no such thing as you know, bad data, any, any information, especially if you're going from a, a situation where you've been winging it with pricing and monetization and kind of throwing a thumb up in the air and, and guessing, um, any data you can bring to the tables is good. Uh, I would say this is the 
in my estimation, the, one of the lower quality forms of data, asking people about a hypothetical is not as reliable as some of the other, the other, the, the other branch or approach in pricing that I can uh, elaborate on if, if that's helpful. The opening case study of the book Blue Ocean Strategy is about Cirque du Soleil. The authors documented how Cirque du Soleil was an incredible innovation. Never before had circuses been performed in grand theatres. Many predicted it would fail, but as we know, it turned out to be a huge success. Now imagine, right before launching, if bosses at Cirque du Soleil asked West End customers or Broadway theatre goers how much they would pay to go and watch this circus act. Most would probably refuse to answer, saying they would never go to the circus. And those that did would probably just say, well, I'll pay five or ten dollars. After all, that is the going rate for circus tickets. And yet, Cirque du Soleil actually charges ten times that with tickets rarely going for less than a hundred dollars. Relying solely on customer feedback for pricing decisions can be a huge mistake. Emmanuel has another example of how asking customers about pricing can cause problems. The situation I, I think about a lot is movie theater popcorn, which is a little bit contrived because it's a captive market. But if you had surveyed people and asked them what they'd be willing to pay for popcorn, no one in their right mind would have told you, you know, $25 for a, a bucket of popcorn. A movie theater would have said, you know, it costs us 30 cents. We're going to tack on a 30% margin. We'll charge $3 for popcorn. And that would have been the end of the conversation. Some clever movie theater operator tested it out to say, listen, I think we can charge a premium for our concessions as people come in and we restrict the you know people from bringing in their, their uh, own outside um, uh, you know food and beverage. They tested it and it worked and that became disseminated throughout that that entire industry. But if you had surveyed people, you never would have arrived at that opportunity. No one would have told you their willingness to pay was 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 that high. In the U.S., one of the best-selling peanut butter products, Skippy did something incredible. They got customers to spend 10% more for their product without anybody realizing. Their strategy was simple. Rather than simply increase their prices, they added a small dimple to the bottom of the peanut butter jar. This dimple decreased the volume of the peanut butter in the jar by 10%. Instead of containing 18 ounces as before, it now contained 16.3 ounces. Skippy kept the price of their product the same, and overnight they had a 10% increase in revenue. It's a simple strategy that makes a lot of sense. Many customers are very price sensitive and would balk at a 10% increase, but far fewer customers are weight sensitive and don't realize if their package has decreased in size. Skippy's successful approach was shared far and wide in business books and magazines across the states and many business leaders applied similar approaches to their business. Want to increase your movie revenue? Well, shorten the movie. Want to increase your airline profits? Well, decrease the legroom. What about B2B sales? Well, just offer less services. But there is a problem here. One company's strategy won't always work for another. Taking one nudge and applying it elsewhere without testing is pretty much doomed to fail. Here's Emmanuel explaining why. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, nudges or psychological-based pricing because I think they're o overused and are often used as substitutes for sound pricing research. It's certainly true that those tactics work and the you know phenomenon of 99-cent price endings or uh, avoiding extremes. The, the classic example that I've seen repeatedly with SaaS is every SaaS company wants three packages, <laughs> good, better, best. The enterprise package, the third package is always the decoy. They're trying to drive people towards the middle. And it's, it's exploiting this very real behavior of consumers to rely on heuristics, rules of thumb, approximations. We're all inundated with offers every single day. And so we develop these ways of processing the information and making decisions quickly. Instead of what a company should do is figure out how many packages do we actually need? What segments are we serving? What packages make sense? Maybe it's four segments. Maybe four packages make sense. Maybe it's no packages whatsoever. Maybe you don't have enough, enough features to really justify that sort of bundling opportunity. You're going to make way more money in designing and engineering compelling, enticing packages than you are in spending 30 seconds slapping together a bunch of uh, tactics you heard uh, work 
and, and moving on. So if you start with the foundation of who are my customers, what am I selling to them? Why would they care? And do all the necessary pricing research to sort of serve as a firm foundation, then layering in these nudges and tactics on top to drive and, and compel the kind of behavior that I'm looking for. That's a winning combination, but ignoring the first part of it and going straight to the nudges, uh, I, I've seen not work out so well. Testing if a nudge, strategy, or psychological phenomenon works for you in your market is vital. Here's Emmanuel explaining how to set up your own tests, how to make sure you're collecting relevant data, and how to effectively apply some of these principles. The, the most effective way of thinking about pricing tests is, if possible, to structure your tests in an A-B framework. So I think marketers, especially e are very familiar with that context. If you look at Optimizely, running split tests, um, to you know, traffic to your site and testing different variations of layout and, and copy and so on and so forth. It's in effect the same set of tools that you would use in running pricing tests. You, it's easier to do in a B2B context, which is where I, I live, uh, but we have, we'll structure a test in, in such a way that um, our reps are offering two variations of an offer to the market. And the, the work in setting up the test is really to control for as many confounding variables as we can, such that the only difference that explains the revenue lift or conversion lift or whatever KPI we're interested in, the only thing that explains the difference between our test and control groups is the thing that we're, we're measuring, the pricing change or the package change or the discount change. The problem of just making a change in your business and then seeing what happens is at the conclusion, so let's say you, you raise prices 10% and then wait a month. The question you're going to have a, a month later is, well, was it really the pricing change or was it like competitors that did something different? Did traffic go up or down? You're going to be plagued with this problem of confounding variables of other things that could, that could explain the overall impact to your business that you see. For your test to be successful, you have to be able to compare it to a control. Without a control, you'll never be able to conclusively tell if your test has worked. A classic example of this is in website redesigns. Say you updated your website last week and sales rose by 5%. Now you won't conclusively know if that is down to the new site or instead due to seasonality or something else. Without a control, you will never tell. A study by Mandel and Johnson highlights this. They wanted to see if students would pay more for sofas online if they were primed by money. So they sent 79 students to one of two sites. Now one site was the control, it had no priming. They simply saw the sofa on a fluffy cloud in the image which was selling the sofa. Now 36% of these students declared an intent to pay for that sofa. The other half of students saw the variable the test. Instead of seeing a sofa on a fluffy cloud, it showed pennies on a green dollar shaded background. (laughs) These students were primed to buy that money and 56% apparently showed an intent to pay. The findings are interesting of course, but really the point is that Mandel and Johnson couldn't have found this out without an A-B test. If you don't compare your new idea to a control, you'll never understand if it has an effect. So what does good pricing look like? What are some examples of marketers who have overcome these mistakes to generate success? I asked Emmanuel. I think one very dramatic example that everyone's very familiar with is is really SaaS. That was a pricing and monetization innovation, and that transformed that entire, uh, that entire industry. The product stayed the exact same. The way they monetized was different. Instead of charging a one-time perpetual license, uh, which was very cost prohibitive, migrating to uh, a subscription model, just changing the the terms of the sale completely changed that entire industry. It, it just, to me, is the most crystal clear and accessible way of explaining what can happen if you get pricing right. Pricing in, I read this great book called uh, Pricing the Third Business Skill, which I'd recommend everyone go pick up. And the author talks about Pricing is a creative discipline, which I I read uh, initially and thought that was kind of a confusing sentence because it seems so obviously scientific and data-driven and so on and so forth. And his point was that 
pricing requires continuous experimentation. Figuring out what works requires ex- continuous experimentation and trial and error. The SaaS example isn't unique. It has been replicated elsewhere too. We've talked on the show before about how Amazon Prime, a subscription to receive free delivery on your Amazon products, has been widely successful despite many predicting it to fail. Another great example from the book Priceless is the German Rails Barn Card. Now for around €400 per year, this card discounts 50% of all travel on German Rail. So a ticket that used to cost you €20 with this card will only cost you €10. The new pricing model proved to be incredibly successful for the organisation, attracting over 3 million customers, making the company a huge amount of additional profit despite the discounts they were offering. In fact, it's so successful that the German Rail now offers a Barn 100 card. For €3,500, this card provides free travel across Germany for the whole year. It too brings in a major profit for the company. Finding novel and creative ways to change your pricing can have a major impact on your bottom line. Yet so many organisations fail to do this. They pick a pricing strategy and stick with it for too long. Take the barn card. It is incredible to me that UK rail companies and other major European countries don't offer something similar. It has worked so well in Germany and yet other regions haven't even tested it out. Now that's almost all we have time for today but before I left Emmanuel I had one final question. He has spent years thinking, working and testing prices so I asked what is one of the worst pricing strategies that he's seen? I've seen e-publishers try to, to charge a subscription basis for textbooks, uh, which always struck me as being very silly. Uh, people are purchasing your textbook and reading it. Why would they pay you an annual contract for, for a monthly subscription for a book? A, an example of like a price metric, I've seen lots of examples of price metrics that seem from the business side to make perfect sense, but from the customer side, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. There you have it, a subscription service that works for SaaS, Amazon Prime and German rail companies won't necessarily work for eBooks. That is why you have got to test your price and see if it works for you. Okay, that is all for today's episode. We've covered problems with asking customers how much they'll pay, why choosing a price based on your costs isn't smart and how it is important to test your strategy. I want to say a huge thank you to Emmanuel for coming on the show. If your business needs to work on their pricing strategy, then I'd suggest getting in touch with Emmanuel. His pricing technology company, Run Pricing Tests, does some great work in finding out what price will work best for you and your business. If you're interested in getting in touch with him, I've left a link to his website in the show notes. Now, before I go, I wanted to remind all of you about the brilliant neuromarketing course put together by previous Nudge guests, Dr. Matt Johnson and Prince Gooman. The fantastic duo have created the world's first neuromarketing certification bootcamp. It will be held live on Zoom on December 4th to December 6th. Now, their three-day course covers everything from perception to emotion to subliminal messaging and, of course, tips to apply these approaches to your marketing and your work. The course is guaranteed to help you improve your work and grow your business. And so if you liked listening to Matt and Prince on the show, then I really recommend checking the course out. Some brilliant news, especially is that Nudge listeners can get a special $500 off the price of the course. So simply enter the coupon code NUDGEPOD, that is all one word, NUDGEPOD, to get your discount at checkout. So to find out more and to sign up for that course, head to popneuro.com and select Bootcamp. I've also left a link to the course in the show notes below, so you can click there to find out more. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Nudge. I'll be back in two weeks with another brilliant two-part episode with one of the UK's smartest minds in behaviour economics. So please don't miss it.